This is a sermon on healing and faith. I'll start the sermon. My wife will complete it with her testimony. I will be brief so I can leave this to her. I love listening to her testimony. And she's going to give more than a testimony. She's going to give an understanding of what's behind this in Christ. I'd like to begin with just a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit may guide this talk. May you please speak through myself and my wife that the words you would have us hear and the understanding you would have us have may come forward and touch our hearts. Amen. For this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to read something first from Spirit of Prophecy. With all our treatments given to the sick, simple fervent prayer should be offered for the blessing of healing. Where does it come from? The one who answers that prayer. We are to the point, we are to point the sick to the compassionate Savior and his power to forgive and to heal. She puts them together. His power to forgive and to heal. Amen. Through his gracious providence, they may be restored. Through his providence, they may be restored. Not through ours, through his. Point the sufferers to their advocate in the heavenly courts. Tell them that Christ will heal the sick if they will repent and cease the transgression to transgress the laws of God. Remember abstemiousness? I pray you do. The laws of God. There is a Savior who will reveal himself in our sanitariums to save those who will submit themselves to him. The suffering ones can unite with you in prayer, confessing their sin and receiving pardon. Then she makes this other comment. Should the Lord work a miracle to restore the wonderful machinery which human beings have impaired through their own carelessness and inattention and their indulgence of appetite and passions, that's a mouthful, by doing the very things that the Lord has told them they should not do, he would be ministering to sin, which is the transgression of his own law. So we pray for healing. Pray for obedience. Pray that you may cooperate with the Lord that do the work that he asks you to do, that he can do the work that he will do in you to heal and to save. So I'm going to focus on one word in the Bible, the word sozo. It's spelled S-O-Z-O, but it's pronounced like suds. Sozo. And in the New Testament, in the Greek, it translates as to save, deliver or protect, heal and preserve, to be made whole. Now Jesus used this word interchangeably with salvation, forgiveness of sins, and healing and being made whole. The same word. There's two stories I'd like to cite. The first is in chapter 7 of Luke. Go with me please to the 7th chapter of Luke. Starting in verse 47. Luke, the 7th chapter, verse 47. The story of Mary Magdalene. She had sinned, was caught in her sins, and was threatened. Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Why? For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth how much? Little. little. So her healing is dependent upon what? Her love and asking for forgiveness. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say with them themselves, who is this that forgives sins and also forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, sozo, saved thee. Thy sins have sozo, have saved thee. Go in peace. Now the Lord's peace is not like our peace. 
In Ephesians 2, we read about peace. His feast is reconciling man with God, making the two one, the twain one in him, so making peace. Go in peace. He's asking us to go in peace, to go in oneness with Christ in the Father, which means being dead to self and hid with Christ in God. Deep healing, being dead to self. One other story. Go with me, please, to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to see the same juxtaposition between healing and forgiveness. This is a man who was sick with the palsy. He was a paralytic. And we'll see that his sins were forgiven as he was healed of his paralysis. And he glorified God. Let's see how this worked out. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 2. Ninth chapter of Matthew, second verse. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy. He was paralyzed, lying in a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now remember how he came in with four people bringing him down to the feet of Jesus. Like Mary Magdalene, he had faith. He believed that Jesus could heal him. And those who brought him had the same faith. And behold, certain of the scribes said unto the, with them themselves, This man blasphemeth. He claims to forgive sins. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Now, does Jesus know our thoughts? Continually. Do we believe that? then why do we keep having the thoughts that we have? Guard the thoughts. Bring them each into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And that's only possible in Christ. We plead with him. We fall broken on the rock. We yearn for his mind. We yearn for his connection with the Father. We learn for that obedience with every thought being brought into that same captivity. Then he said, whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. He's asking them the question. Which would you rather hear? Have your sins be forgiven or be healed? Sozo, the same. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to, his, to the sick of the palsy, arise Take up thy bed and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Praise God. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified whom? God. They saw the work of God, which had given such power unto men. So here Jesus is telling us the clear connection between salvation, forgiveness, and healing. So when we're healed, what's doing that? Only the power of God, the same power that saves us, heals us. So I'm going to yield the rest of this talk to my wife. She will tell you her story, which is powerful. I knew her after this, years later. But I spoke with the physician that worked with her to thank her. And she will tell you the story. I, I would like to pray before we speak. Before I say a word, I need prayer because this is not an easy thing for me to share. I haven't shared it that many times. So, Father, I just ask that I can be lost in you and that only you will be seen. Please give me your spirit just now that I can share these things only to glorify you and that we would receive the same power that created the earth to recreate us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
I want to start off by reading a quotation. This comes from, it was written in October 18 in the Review and Herald. And that's October 18, 1898. The knowledge of what the scriptures means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. We cannot have a healthy Christian experience until the science of faith, the science of faith, is better understood and until more faith is exercised. We suffer much trouble and grief because of our unbelief and our ignorance of how to exercise faith. So I'm hoping my testimony will, will help us, will teach us, will show us and educate us how to exercise faith. But what is faith? So Jesus gave an, an example of what faith is. And we can all turn to this um, in Matthew 8. And for time, we're just going to read a couple verses here, beginning in verse 5. Matthew 8, verse 5. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Skip down to verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, I'm not in Israel. So Jesus is giving the example of the greatest faith that he'd ever seen by a human, by a mortal human being. What was the faith? So what is faith? The faith, the servant wanted something done. And he said, speak the word only, and it's done. Isn't that how Jesus created the earth? And God said, let there be light. There was light. What is faith? Faith is the believing that the word of God accomplishes what it says. That's it. What is faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is believing that the word of God accomplishes what it says. I tell the children in a children's story, if, the word of, if you're feeling grouchy and irritable and you're fighting with your sister or your brother and you go to the word and the word of God says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. If you know that faith is accomplishing, God's word accomplishing what it says, then you say, yes, Lord, I believe you. And now we're told that when we ask for temporal things and various things, sometimes the answer is delayed or it's no. But not so when we ask for forgiveness of sin. The answer, I mean, excuse me, victory over sin. The answer is immediate. God's word creates what it says. We're not evolutionists that we believe that God speaks something and then something else has to happen, and then something else, and something else added to God's word. God's word speaks what it says, and then when, it, when we receive what it says, it creates it in our heart. Okay, it's important to know this when you hear my story. So, um, if, if God said um, to us that our word is not like man's word, would we believe him that God's word is different than our word? We've never seen God create the earth. We haven't seen his word do anything powerful. By Psalms 33, 6 and 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. We're told in Psalms 51, 10, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. So when we believe God's word, it is so. Our mind is renewed in the spirit, and it is so. His word creates righteousness. 
Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Hmm. What spirit is in your mind when you're, when you're not believing God? It's the wrong spirit. When you're believing him, you are renewed in the spirit of your mind and you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. How is righteousness and true holiness created? By the word of God speaking and our faith that when he speaks, it is so. Amen. We must start doubt, stop doubting the word of God. Amen. It's the same word that created the earth. And so I had been studying these things, and I was reading this book. This is what my testimony. This was um, back in 1984. And I was reading this book. This is called Lessons of Faith. There's all different cover, covers on it by, by um, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. If you haven't read this book, you need to get this book. Okay, Lessons on Faith. And I learned these things, and they got rooted in me. And it was God's mercy that I had learned these things before my big crisis of what happened to me. <clears throat> Let's look at our key text before, because this was the one that I hung on to when there was no hope. There was no evidence of any hope whatsoever. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of what you're hoping for. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance and the evidence isn't even seen, but it's there because the substance is Jesus and his word creates. So faith is the substance of what you're hoping for when there's no evidence. And then verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that we see are not made of the things which do appear. Now. This is saying that God's word made creation happen. And we don't understand the power of God's word. It's nothing like our word. Our word has no power. And so God's word creates. But look at verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of him that diligently seeks him. So, so with that text in mind, I'm going to tell you um, my story. On August 6th of 1984, it was less than two weeks after my third child was born. I had just given birth to a baby girl, my daughter, Chantel. My right arm became numb, and I started to lose the use of it. I kept thinking, what's happening to my arm? And I rapidly lost the, the full use of my arm, and, I, and then my leg started to go. And it would, when I tipped my head down, I'd get a shock. It would go all the way down my body my, to my leg. And pretty soon, my leg wasn't operating right either. I was kind of dragging it along. I was 32 years old. And I had a newborn baby and two sons that were ages two and eight. And my husband traveled a lot for his work. I made the decision to exercise the faith that I had been reading about in this book that I just told you about. Faith is believing that God's word creates what it says. So I started looking in the Bible for texts that said that I would be healed. And I shared some of those with you um, in, the, in the morning lesson that we had. And I made the decision that I would just believe God was going to take care of this. There was a problem. I hadn't been eating right. The last three months of my pregnancy, the last trimester, the doctor had told me that I was going to have a premature baby if I didn't stay down. So I went to my mother-in-law's and so she could watch the children. And I stayed in bed without sunlight, without exercise, 
without eating right because she ate eggs and dairy and she cooked for me and I decided I'm gonna just and lots of sweets. She wanted to fatten up that baby. And so I didn't, wasn't eating right. I didn't follow the laws of health. But I decided I was going to believe. I, I put my finger on Mark 9, 23 and 24. Jesus said, if you, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And I, I decided I was going to believe. And I cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. And so I started believing more. But you know, it kept getting worse. And so I went to the doctor, and the, to a neurologist, and he uh, took spinal fluid out of my spine, and he put dye in there to be sure there wasn't some kind of a obstruction or something. And then he tested my eyes and did all kinds of optical tests. And he and, uh, told me to come back in a few days. And I came back, and he said, um, you have a very clear case. You have alkaline bands in your spinal fluid. Your IgG ratio is, is showing you have an infection in the, spinal, in the spinous process, in the, in the spinal area, in the spinal cord. And your optical read this and this and showed me that you have a very clear case and a very fast-moving case of multiple sclerosis. I looked at him, and to this day, I do not know why this, how I had the strength. It was because I was reading and studying about faith. I said to him, no, I don't. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, well, you can go into denial if you want, but this is moving so fast that you're going to need to make plans to be in a wheelchair really soon, and your your case is really easy to define. This, you have a very solid case of multiple sclerosis. I said, no, I don't. And he looked at me again, and, and I said, I have a savior who is the, who's a healer, and he has told me in his word that he will put on me none of these diseases. No disease can come on me. And he got up from his chair. He pulled his jacket down, I'll never forget it, and he said, as he was leaving the room, well, you can hide behind your religion, but it's not going to change the fact you have multiple sclerosis, and you're going to be in, a, in, in ambulatory very, very soon. And he went out the door. So I sat there a while, and I said, wait a minute. I have the faith. Um, why is this here? What is happening to me? So what does real faith do? Does faith just take something because you believe it, or does it produce action? What does faith do? I, I, in the study, my study of Romans, I found out that faith produces, it's a faith that works. It's a faith that produces the good works. We're saved by faith, but that faith produces good works. Amen. And so... I became convinced that my, my condition was related to my bad health habits that I had had. And so I started to read um, our prophet. I started to read about the laws of health, the, ten law, the eight laws of health, pure air, sunlight, abstinence, rest, exercise, proper diet, and the right use of water. So I called Agatha Thrash. How many of you have heard of Agatha Thrash? She's passed away now. Um, she's the only naturopath I knew. I hadn't met my husband yet that I have now. And so I called her up, and I told, I told her, and she told me what to do. She said, you need to eat at least 80% raw foods because the live enzymes of those foods will counteract this, this inflammation. And and you need to do fever baths and hydrotherapy and all these things. And I'm just saying, what? What? Am I gonna, who's, so my mother came to stay with me. And so when, when my mother came, she, she told me later she thought I was dying because I just couldn't function. She just thought, oh, one time I slept all day and she went in to see if I was still alive. And she took care of my children and my newborn baby. 
And so, but I knew that faith had to produce some works in me. Otherwise, it's presumption. And so I studied God's word, and I studied all that I could about the relationship between faith and works, and I felt that I had to make some action. So I determined to partner with God for my healing. And through all of this, I finally came to a big decision. I would eat all raw foods. I would eat from my breakfast sprouted buckwheat. Sprouted buckwheat. And it's actually sweet, like a little, when it's raw. It's actually tasteful. And I would heap on it every kind of fruit I could find. And then for my second meal, my mom would make me this big salad, and I would put everything you can imagine in it. I would put raw cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, um, celery, um, onions, shredded raw beets, avocado, tomatoes, parsley, cilantro, basil, and and sometimes even some fresh dill and zucchini and raw corn and sweet peppers and, and um, raw peas. And I would uh, found out that f after a while that this is, these, these foods take a lot of time. It's taking a lot of time from my mom. And I was craving some other kinds of foods. So I had to get on my knees. And I said, faith is what I'm hoping for when there's no evidence. Your word has spoken. You put on me none of these diseases. I need you to empower me through your word. And I claimed every promise in the Bible for God to hold me up. The same, the same word I learned in the book, Lessons on Faith, the same word that put the sun in the sky. Can, that same word that is, the, is the power of his word to heal me. In fact... I started thinking, have you ever woke up in the morning and said, oh, I really am concerned. I'm very worried that the sun might fall out of the sky. <laughs> oh, it's just, I can't stand it. It could fall out. No, we know that God's word keeps it from falling. But his word also says, unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. The, the same kind of joy that the bride has at the, when, when, at the end when his church is, God's church is received by Christ. All of heaven was rejoicing. Let us rejoice and be glad and give honor to him for the marriage of the bride has come. She, the bride has made herself ready. How'd she make herself ready? She partnered with God. And to her was granted, that's a gift, that she would be arrayed with fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, the righteousness of the saints. So I said, okay, Lord, empower me. Give me this fine linen, this robe, because I don't really want to just chew on vegetables raw all the time, even though these salads are nice, but I'm having a hard time. So I found another quote that God just helps you. Have you ever noticed how God helps you when you're really, when you're hungry? Blessed are you that hunger and thirst after righteousness. He fills you. And I was just groping at this point. And my faith was groping. And so um, I found this quote. It's in Councils on Diets and Foods. We all need to read that book. And an abstinence, an abstinence, abstinence diet for a month or two would convince many sufferers that the path of self-denial is the path of health. Amen. The abstinence in your diet for one or two months would convince me that, and show me self-denial, and this is the way of health? Okay, all right, I'm serious, Lord. I believe you've healed me. And so I started again, stronger than ever. And after two months, my faith became very strong, and I found out that people's taste buds change when you are clean. I see this at the health retreats that we have at our ranch. People's taste buds change, and food starts to taste wonderful. And you start to, to, to notice the various uh, flavors 
that you never even noticed before. And so, but I didn't have any evidence that it was doing a thing in my body. Faith is what you hope for when there's no evidence. So I said, I believe I am healed. I started telling everybody, I'm healed. I, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't have any. What did the doctor tell you? Well, it doesn't matter what the doctor said because I am going with what God says. Amen. And so they, people started thinking I was really getting strange. I can remember walking dragging my leg because I had to do all the laws of health. One was exercise. I'm walking outside, breathing really deep. And every time I'd breathe out, I'd say, praise God, I'm healed. I'd walk further. Praise God, I'm healed. At first, I could only walk about a half a block or a block, and then I, it got, I got stronger. But she was walking with me. She goes, that's driving me crazy. You're not healed. Look at you. You're not healed. And I said, but faith is what I'm hoping for when there's no evidence. It's true because God's word said it. Let me tell you some of the things God has said in his word. Faith is the substance. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> if I could see that I was healed, I told her, I wouldn't need faith. I, and then she kept talking, and she was talking negative, negative, negative. And I said, I believe that I'm healed in Jesus' name. And she looked at me, and I, and I started to cry. And I said, Jesus said, as your faith is, so be it unto you. Amen. And when I believe to God's word, his word creates what it says. And his word says that he has healed me. I am whole in Christ, as my faith is. Unto him, he has healed me. You know, I've learned that the only thing that can stop the word of God from creating what it says is the doubting heart of man. Because all of nature, it doesn't have a will to doubt. We're going to read in a minute here about Jesus on the, sh on, the sh on the ship, or we'll talk about it. When he stood up and said, peace be still, his word accomplished what it said. Nobody's there to doubt. But those fishermen in the boat, they were doubting. We'll talk more about that in a second. So I got into an, an ag agonizing mode, and I learned about Jacob, who said, I will not let go unless you bless me. And I was literally telling God, I have three little children. I need to raise them in the Lord. Thank you for healing me. So I started praising him, and I would just praise him that I was healed. My husband at that time started thinking maybe there was something a little bit wrong with me, and they had me uh, give a talk about faith at church, and I told what I'm telling you, that I'm healed. And a lady afterwards came up to me, and she said, you know, I think you need to say, I believe God's going to heal me. And I said, well, then I would be an evolutionist because God's word creates what it says. <laughs> that was in my sermon, too, that I, I talk, shared. <clears throat> so about two or three weeks after my daughter's first birthday, one morning, I woke up, and I looked, and I was wiggling my finger. And I squeezed it. And I said, I can feel my finger. I can move my finger. My hand was like this. just. And I said, praise God, I'm healed. I knew Jesus. I knew you would do this. And my husband goes, oh, Rhonda. He says, so you can wiggle a finger. I said, yes, look at that. He goes, so you're wiggling your finger. I said, yes, I'm wiggling my finger. He goes, OK, you're wiggling your finger. So, but for me, I knew it was true. It had been a year. I had stayed on raw foods for a year. I had been on that cleanse. I'd been doing all of my exercises and all of my fresh air and sunlight and trusting in divine power and all the water and water therapy. And I said, you have, I have partnered with you and now you are, have healed me. You're showing me the evidence that I hadn't been able to see all this time. And so 
I'll, I'll just tell you that it was just so fast after that that it's not possible. My body just started to recover just quickly within a matter of days. And every day I'd praise him more and I'd, say, I'd cry and, and just be so grateful to him and tell the Lord, look what you have done. You're so mighty. You're so awesome. You're so incredible. And it brought forth out of me this huge gratitude and drew me so close to him because pretty soon I was completely normal. Now, my hands are the same. In fact, I've done massage therapy for 18 years or something. My hands are the same. My strength is the same. There's, there's no, nothing but total healing that happened to my body. But why did God take so long? There was a work to do in my heart of surrender. Faith is, and surrender are the same thing. If you don't have surrender, your faith is phony. Your faith is a counterfeit faith. And so I had to surrender. I had lots of things, and still do, that needed to be surrendered. <clears throat> but that's not the end of my story. And this part, I've never told another human being, I mean, anybody. I, I just say, well, yeah, this, I was widowed in 1988. And they say, oh, what happened? I said, well, maybe someday I'll get close enough to you to talk about it. But it was... Just three and a half years later, my husband made a very bad business decision, and he, um, he, we lost everything. We lost everything. Even our home, the bank was taking it back, our dream home. We lost everything we had. And four days later, after he lost all, everything, he committed suicide. Now, God knew that the end from the beginning, and in his mercy, I should have seen that at least he kept me alive so my kids were not completely orphaned. But just so you don't think, oh, Rhonda has this amazing <laughs> faith. I was just like Peter. When one minute Jesus was saying, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, that, that the Father revealed, who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's being honored. Just a few minutes, just the very next ver two verses, Peter did a gigantic flip-flop in his faith. The Father had revealed, had given him faith that Jesus was the Son of God. But Jesus did a big, Peter did a huge flip-flop. And now, what caused the flip-flop? The flip-flop was caused because Jesus told him, read it yourself, that he, it's time for him to go to Jerusalem and he would be, he would be killed. So fear came into Peter and he was just consumed with fear. And so he said, Oh, Lord, be it far from you. These, these things can't be. Because what would happen if his Savior was killed? He would be destitute. And his idea that Christ was going to take the kingdom would be demolished. Well, do you know that I passed the test, the first test of faith. But when it came to the second one, when all that I loved and all that I knew and all my security and all my finances and all of our happy, wonderful life was removed, I found out that I was building on sand and not on the rock. Okay? Now, when the storm comes and we build on the rock, we cling to Jesus. What I did is I went out in the woods behind my house and I shook my fist at God and I said, what kind of God are you? I prayed before I married this man. There were lots of men in college. I prayed. And you brought, allowed this man to father three children to me. And these three children need a dad, and you could have prevented this from happening. And what kind of God are you? And now watch what I did. Watch this. The minute you doubt God, what, kind of, what comes in? You start blaming him. Remember Adam and Eve? 
and you blame him and you hold up your own righteousness. Adam and Eve, they sowed fig leaves. But I did a whole lot more than that. What I did was I cried out to God and I said, didn't I teach Sabbath school class? Didn't I give Bible studies and lead people to Christ? Didn't I, this is just unbelievable I could do this, didn't I get rid of my TV? Didn't I try to eat right? Didn't I continue to eat right after you healed me? What kind of God are you? Tell me in the Bible, I learned this later, where is it that God's people do not suffer? Peter said, count it all joy when you suffer. Are we greater than our master? Do we think we're God, that we're greater than our master? I think that that's what happened to me. So just so you can see how quickly our faith can change. In a nutshell, I had to learn the hard way. I need the faith of Jesus. My faith, even my faith, needs to come as Jesus' faith. My righteousness comes as Jesus' righteousness. My mind, I'm transformed by the renewing of my, my mind comes. We have the mind of Christ. Everything about us, we need it to come by our connection with Jesus, his righteousness. I was told you I was going to read about the storm. The main thing, let's turn very, very quickly in closing to Mark 4, verses 35 to 40, and I'm just going to touch on some highlights. You can look at the story. Jesus, we know the story. There was, um, let's read just part of it here. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was, in the ship, there were also little ships around, and there are verse 37, Hebrews, excuse me, Mark 4, 37, and there arose a storm of wind. Now, I had a storm of wind that hit me pretty hard. Here's a storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that the boat was full. It was filling up. The boat was sinking. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and said, Master, here's what I did too, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care about me? Don't you care what's happening here? Why did you let this happen? And so Jesus said in verse 40, first he stands up, peace be still, he rebukes the wind, his word accomplishes what it says instantly. And Jesus said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? That's verse 40. Their fear destroyed their faith. Now, I was walking around thinking I had a pretty strong faith. But we have something very fearful coming upon us in this nation, a time of trouble such as never has been on the whole world since the beginning of time. Do you know that your fear can destroy your faith? And so, perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that these fishermen were looking at each other's faces and they forgot that Jesus was even in the boat. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we must watch always unto all things and yield them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I can't, I can't describe to you the shock and the horror and the emotional pain and the fear that knocked me into a pit of anguish at that time. Once our faith departs, we can no longer believe in his love for us, and I really became angry at God. So when that happens, God has to just leave us alone until we're seeking him again. And that's what happened to me. We face crises. They show what's really in us. And so I just want you to know that no matter how much faith that you may think you have, 
We must go like Jacob and agonize and plead for purity of heart. It was faith that released the healing power of God to heal me physically. But now I needed the faith to heal me in my character. To heal me in my character. And that's what we all need. When Jesus' faith becomes our faith, when Jesus' life becomes our life, when Jesus' character becomes our character, then we will stand, we'll cling to the rock, and we will know that in Christ, he, all things have been overcome. He said, do not fear, I have overcome the world. He's overcome everything that's going to happen to us or that could happen to us. And I just ask that we would now lift up our hearts to thank him in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the rock and that we can cling to you as we give you, casting all our care upon you and know that you care for us. Lord, enhance our relationship. Pour upon us your spirit and let us behold you. For by beholding, we become changed. And we ask that we would know how to praise you, Lord. Let us all praise you now. Healing of our sins and our health issues. In Jesus' name, amen.